Hey everybody and welcome to episode 10, the 10th anniversary of Words, Images, and Worlds. Very pleased, very, very pleased to be joined today by Kelly Jones. Kelly Jones being uh, an author and artist who's been around for some time and who was a big part of my reading life, uh, reading comics and uh, not just back in the day, back in the 90s when I was reading comics, but I continue to to read your work. Um, so thank you so much for joining me today. I appreciate it, Jason. It's a real pleasure to be here. And may I just say I'm loving like the atmosphere. I've got a digital background here. Yeah. Um, listeners on the podcast can't see the background, but I love that we've got uh, some Frankenstein there <laughs> and some skeletons around you and, and all of that sort of thing. Well, and that's, I, that's just uh, my studio. It's, you know, you, you create an atmosphere, right? To It's the only place. I mean, the rest of the house ain't like this, <laughs> you know, right, right. Place, but it's just a place that kind of gets you in the mood to do it. You know? Yeah. I see over your shoulder. I think one of the first works of yours that I encountered was probably uh, Batman Red Rain. Uh, I think yeah. that was maybe one of the first ones. Um, yeah. and, and since then, I've gone back through and looked at uh, the things you were doing before that. But definitely uh, a story. I was a big Elseworlds reader. I loved Batman. Yep. That was yep. what connected me with comics. Yeah. Um, so so certainly a, an intriguing vision there. I do think that was the the first time I saw your work in print, though, was yep. Red Rain. That was that was uh, um, pretty big when it came out and no one knew it would be that big. I certainly mm -hmm. didn't know. But um, it was uh, one of those uh really good things that happened i didn't i i didn't know i mean obviously in, in that it sold well but i didn't think it would and um i think it was done as a passion project for doug minch the writer mm -hmm. and i was very new to that company so um it's one of those things where i'm really glad i poured that much effort into something even though i didn't think it had legs or anything um because everybody showed up to see it. So um, you, I'm glad I didn't dog it through it all. I mean, it's just uh, uh, because you don't know what, what anything will do, right? You, you hope. And, um, and if, if it uh, certainly with that book and it's still around, it's still in print, it's still doing its thing. And I think that's a testament to its um, very different nature to what it is. And it's a very true obviously it's vampires and Batman, but it's a very true in the telling in that it's a sincere thing. And as anything Gothic goes, even if all your objectives are met, it can be a disaster. And I think people loved the fact that it did that because you kept thinking the tropes of comics are what we all know. And this one actually went into new trope zone. <laughs> you know, there was, Definitely. you can't trust your, 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 uh, your comic book, um, experiences because this one did go its own route so and then through two other uh mm -hmm. volumes and, and you're absolutely right like the world that was created there just worked well together sometimes you have yeah. ideas that are sort of thrown together in comics and it's like oh, okay i love both of these characters so i'll go with this but uh in your hands and in doug mentions hands uh it just felt like it came together so well, a gothic, yeah when it's got when something's gothic um, people use that term a lot, but what what Gothic does mean is beyond its time frame or beyond it it its uh, uh, look. Mm -hmm. What it genuinely can mean is not necessarily a good ending, and that, that and and Gothic doesn't mean cool; it means something completely different. And I don't want to ruin it. So I don't want to say it because it'll ruin oh, it yep. if someone hasn't read it. <laughs> um, but it can mean something completely different, yet the objectives are met. Right? Definitely. It doesn't descend into cynicism. It doesn't descend into to some kind of a snarkiness. It's like uh, it keeps this, isn't this terrible, but you want to still read this or you still want to be here. Um, you, you, don't, you don't know where it's going. Um, I think, uh, any great 
any great gothic masterpiece uh if you were to go in and give it a happy ending it would ruin it so a good man really is hard to find it I is mean, you know you you if you found a good man at the end of that story it just wouldn't work quite as well yeah and even if he's not a good man but does good things that then becomes the moral or ethical question to the reader which is the point you know does any of this justify anything um, or would you do go to these great ends to even at your cost of yourself, which is the heroic um, and all those things are there uh, that make it uh, interesting. So I'm curious um, because your style is so distinctive, uh, literary influences, artistic influences. Oh yeah. I mean, we, we pretty much collect all those and stand on it. So, but for me, I had, I had grown up, uh, speaking of Gothic, loving old, they were new then or, or relatively new in reruns, but I used to really enjoy, um, a couple of television series that were, one was The Outer Limits and the other one was Boris Karloff's Thriller, which were anthology shows. Both would be absolutely defined as gothic though i didn't know the terms i grew up loving 40s films uh film noir and whatnot and those film noir is just detective gothic um mm -hmm. i didn't know those terms but i was always attracted to that anything that was in the dark and with shadows and that kind of spooked me i was curious right i didn't want to i didn't want to live in that world personally i didn't want to be that but i was i was curious of it but it attracted me because the subjects were different and the characters were different. And um, then when I became a little older, I mean, uh, the power of imagery, though I was too young to understand it, my father, for whatever reason, took me at, for when I was six years old to go see uh, Kubrick's 2001 in a theater at, oh, for wow. my birthday. <laughs> and... Uh, I don't know, you know, to this day, I'll never know why, what would make him do that, what what he was assuming, I, I, whether he probably didn't know what the movie was about, just, hey, monkeys and spaceships, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I do not remember, you know, I, there's a lot of stuff you don't remember at a certain time, but the imagery and the music in that stayed with me. And I thought if I, if I were to go back, I probably would have thought it was a horror film because the music was just terrifying. Mm -hmm. and the imagery was terrifying and probably worked for a child because it's not a narrative film it's just i don't even know how to describe it to this day it's not a documentary it's not a drama it's not a it's not linear in that sense it doesn't explain itself and it's very ambiguous so for a kid that's pretty good because you're more willing to receive it but that film made an enormous impact on me just just the oh. sound the music and the images all together. I didn't need to understand the plot or the store, any of that. Um, so uh, as an emotional experience, it was pretty powerful. And that's what stayed with me. If I have a different style, it's due to the fact that everything that I do has nothing to do with the technical end of how you do it. I, I frankly don't care. I, I don't care if if you uh, drawing because it's enough. Yes, you should know what kind of tools you want to use or maybe handling the tools. Mm -hmm. but you don't let the tools dictate and you don't let the rules, whatever they are. I think because it gives a falseness to it. Rules in science. Yes, you can't deviate from them. Physics, biology, whatever the task is that science there is. The scientific method but art it doesn't have that it is it's trying to hold water in your hands it just goes where it wants mm -hmm. and and i clearly i didn't know that once i realized that the best place for me to learn how to draw was not in an art class but in a film class or in a philosophy class or in those places because an art class gives you the false impression that you know, it would be like two plus two equals four, meaning if I do this and get a degree, I'll get a job and da, da, da. And no, no, because somebody can walk in 
off the street who never did it before and only works in number two pencils and they can get your job because the intangible. Mm -hmm. And so I decided to focus on what is that intangible? And that's ideas. And all style comes from ideas. And all ideas create emotion. And emotion is what the reader receives. They don't care how. I mean, you do it, but they want to receive that emotion. So I can't manipulate a reader. I have to be emotional myself in the creation of these works. And if I'm emotional and disciplined, I can get those ideas to paper. You don't sit down and say, I'm going to have a great idea today. Mm -hmm. uh, generally, uh, to draw well, I always tell people, keep doing it and don't judge yourself. Just keep doing it. If, mm -hmm. someone, says you, if someone says you suck, you very well may suck, but that's okay. If someone says you're great, they're probably wrong, but that's okay. You can't do that. What you have to do is have somebody come up to you and look at your work and go, wow. And that doesn't mean photorealistic. Realistic, I always say, is interesting. But, you know, in, in and of itself. But um, that other place, that undisciplined, that whatever it is, that's where that's where everyone goes. That's where the ideas are. So realistic is good. Interesting, far better. And uh, interesting does not say, interesting doesn't say what it is. <laughs> it just is. So so it sounds, uh, what I'm saying is, yes, it probably to hone that is, is, is difficult, but, but it's not, uh, it's not that you're, if people are, taking courses and doing that stuff. I'm not saying don't do that. I'm just saying realize that that's just a discipline. But it's not it's not really where art lies. Um I could teach anyone how to draw. If I were to teach a course, people would be disappointed because I say, "Hey, on the one hand, I'd say, "Hey, look, you don't have to buy any art supplies. You don't have to draw, get any paper because we're not going to do any drawing." And then we're going to learn how to get to that place inside your heart that is trying to do it. It isn't how well you draw hands. It mm -hmm. isn't how you do perspective. It's it's the ideas. And once an idea happens, once you let that happen, it goes everywhere. When I came to DC and I was a young new artist and, and I wanted to you know show them what I could do, I didn't go there uh, thinking the things I'm thinking now. Because I had the technical ability, but I was dry and mediocre and dull by, I, I just was. But I was good enough to take a script, turn it in, and they could go sell it, you know? But I wasn't going to change the universe. So when I got the chance to do Dead Man, nobody cared about Dead Man. Number one, that's good. Number mm -hmm. two, the only good Dead Man was by the great Neil Adams, one of the geniuses of art. It would be like one of the Beatles drew a comic book. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so how do I compete with that? And how do you make yourself known? And that only way to do it is to have an idea so good that they don't see your technical flaws. So when I did Dead Man, not as this heroic guy, but as this skeletal, warped, tra traumatized ghost mm -hmm. that was mm -hmm. always looking like he was hurt. He was always looking like he was in terrible emotional anguish and he's floating around in the, and as a ghost, I figured, well, he doesn't have to follow our laws of physics. He can just do whatever. It's so, it was so visually arresting to people. Now I was doing it just to see what, I, I couldn't go the other route. I didn't know how, I didn't sit there and think, well, everyone's going to love this. Everyone's going to be amazed by it. I didn't think that. I thought, well, if no matter what, they won't say I ripped off Neil. That was it. That was all I was just, I, you know, because every artist had failed the test who had handled this character after Neil, every one of them, as good as they were, they were all going, yeah, but it's not as good as Neil Adams. Mm -hmm. And uh, so so I didn't realize at the time that having a character no one cared about under the shadow of one of the greatest 
if just one of the greatest artists of all time was actually a benefit. Nobody cared and they didn't expect much from you. So you are free, right? You're free. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I was free to do this and it knocked the socks off the company. I didn't know that though. I was turning it in and they were seeing because they traded in ideas, they were looking at an idea happen. And they also knew everything I was just saying. They're saying, wow, they made something. This this kid did something. Now, what the benefit of that is, is not that you make money and that you get published and people pat you on the back. What it is, is you begin to trust yourself. Because if you're going to do this for any length of time, you have to trust that you can do it. There's the blue collar nature of you come to work, you get your work done, you turn it in on time. And you make everybody happy from your editor to your publisher, to your retailer, to your reader. Mm -hmm. And that's a discipline that I would teach in an art class. You're going to hate this kids, but we're all going to do the work <laughs> to make sure it's not about the results. You think it's going to be the results everyone around you, 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 everyone else needs. Uh, and mind you, that's true for fine artists too. They can't sit around and look into the middle distance. They got to produce for their patrons or their or their commissions mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So they got to keep doing it uh their agents will drop them so it's not there's no dodge to the work is what i'm saying it's just in what i'm saying it's a different path to it and what i found with dead man was these ideas spawned other ideas within that character when i came to batman uh kind of the same thing happened yes neil adams drew a great batman but so did a lot of other people Mm -hmm. And they all had their own thing. And the vast majority of who drew Batman followed those other people and didn't distinguish themselves. Yeah. So, so my thing again was, how do I do this to where it's interesting? And every artist, every single artist I ever spoke to said, well, if they were Batman, they would do this. Or if they were Batman, they would see it this. Or how would it really work? And mm -hmm. I didn't think that way. I thought, what if he was chasing me? What if I'd done something where he's coming after me? He is a scary figure. Yes, it is. <laughs> yeah. And I thought, I thought, I wouldn't know any of the details of him. A lot, all the other artists were thinking, well, I know it's Bruce Wayne. I know he knows Gordon. I know he's very wealthy. I know, I know, I know. And I said, I wouldn't know. I'm out uh, trying to rip off a liquor store. Mm -hmm. Or I'm part of a group of guys doing something bad. And... He's coming after me. So I know nothing about him. I don't even know if he's a good guy. I could have been in his turf, right? Like the mafia controls sections of a town. You don't dare anything. Maybe it's his section of the town. I don't know. And Gotham's scary. So I started thinking that way. And the ideas came. He was a silhouette. He was a frightening silhouette. He didn't appear in the day. And he didn't, you didn't know he was there until he let you know he was there. He might have been there for 15 minutes while you're trying to Jimmy open something or you're telling your plans to your bad guy friends or you're whatever you're doing. Mm -hmm. And he will never stop. And he, his whole thing then was to me, it wasn't devices and tools and it was intimidation and fear, which is how they initially created him was fear. So I figured, well, he's a failure if he hits you. So what it is, is all this other stuff. So the cape became alive. The ears became longer. So you could just, all you'd see is all this outline, this mm -hmm. dark, moving, frightening thing. It was like, you know, uh, the Grim Reaper in human form or something. And yeah. it's bearing down on me. And then it drew itself. Everything drew itself. So all of the loves I had did help. All my love of old film noir or gothic type material, my love of Stanley Kubrick, my love of all this stuff, All it all comes together. It wasn't, oh, I'm glad I took this anatomy course on how to draw or figure drawing or how I can use it. It was all of these things. Uh, when I took the film courses and they would explain what symbolism was in a film, Nothing like that was in an art class. Mm -hmm. Why does a character ascend? Well, he's rising, da, 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 or why is he descending? And it simple stuff. Um, 
uh, the slicing of light through a figure or through a face or close up is to show that there's something going on up there. And, mm -hmm. and going, wow, the use of lighting like that um, in the Godfather, everyone's in the back in the dark because they're manipulating from behind. Beautiful use. Now, does an audience need to know it? No, but the emotion of it, they react to. It carries through. And then well, later on, if you want to break it all down, fine. Then you go, hey, good work. But um, I don't think the astronaut wants to know the equation for the rocket to go to the moon. He just wants to know that when he presses the button, it goes. And when it says time to come home, it comes home. He doesn't need to go at all. He just knows how to run it. And that's that's to me what I wanted the reader to be was the astronaut. I'll get him to the moon and back. They don't need to know how. And for the people who want to build the rocket, it's not the way you think. It's how to rethink. So you go into this stuff open. I'll learn what it is, but don't let the rule define you. If you have to change perspective to make something fit, change it. If someone comes up to you and says it's wrong, they don't know how to read a comic book then. It's, it's reading it's, the visual. Wow. It's, it's yes. The writer, the, the, the written word on it, um, doesn't have to match the illustration the illustration should do its thing do not be i i started the my goal was i'm going to be uh mo, every other artist no you got to be very clear on your storytelling i went in some parts other parts i'm going to be ambiguous what does this mean what does that mean mm -hmm. he didn't show me or he showed me something worse but it isn't directly related to what i thought i would see but that's where the symbolism came in. And then once people stop, they go, oh. Or you give them a different angle. You want to slow people down sometimes. So I would do an angle that would take them a second to figure it out. But then it would be an angle that was perfect for Batman or a dead man or a Sandman or a Swamp Thing or whatever I was on. Mm -hmm. um, and it made people more involved in the story. Is that a lot of work? Uh Probably harder than if you just sat down and said, I'm going to show you everything and lead you to the end. I want people to go. You, you want people to invest themselves in it enough to where they start feeling a part of something and they have an investment in it and they feel like now, now I'm caught up in it. And that's emotion. And they want to read their next issue. Yes, they want to carry need, the story. Yes. I want to care. And I want them to care. And um, it's okay if they don't get it right off the bat. I used to drive editors nuts. Kelly, I can't. Da, 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 da. And I said, they don't need to understand right now. Um, they will catch up. And then, then I said, you're going to have a problem. Because now they're going to expect other people to produce this way too. Because they're going, hey, it's too easy. Mm -hmm. And for me, my personal was, I always thought that if I, if I continued to do that, that many, many years later, many years later, my work would still hold up and still look fresh and still be immediate because it wasn't dated to a time. It was just me talking to you personally, mm -hmm. and that would mm -hmm. never be dated to a time. So I always felt if someone went back to my run on Batman or these uh, vampire stories or whatever, or dead man, they go, this could come out right now. And that, and elevates, has, the, that elevates the writing, it elevates the character, it elevates the medium, and it all came from a kid who could not pass an art class. All the ironies. But I got all A's in film class, and I got A's in the, in the more philosophical things and whatever, and I didn't go in there saying, I want to learn something. I wanted to, I wanted to, I went in there like what they wanted, I went in there. I was my own uh, um, syllabus in my head. I wanted to know how to get, and I didn't know how to define it then, but how do I get to these ideas? Because I knew the ideas. Mm -hmm. They excite me. When someone else's idea excites you, let's say, and, and, and they have to grow. Um, when you're a kid, teenager, and you read The Lord of the Rings, you go, adventure story, and it's really exciting, and you believe it. When you become an adult, you go, this means a lot more. And these things here were not just, then it quits being about that. And you're enthralled by this other thing. And mm -hmm. then you, you go, 
uh, when you're a kid, you're always kind of disappointed or sad, I should say, not disappointed, sad at the ending. They get everything and it's sad. When you get older, you say, yeah, I totally understand you're changed after something. And that's genius. Now, a regular editor to books of fantasy or whatever would go, oh, Mr. Tolkien, we need to change that. Let's work on changing, making it happy. And they all have cake and beer for the rest of their lives, you know, or whatever. It is. And he knew that, that in the doing, there's a changing. So I wanted that kind of thing in my books where, where in my art, at least where there was more than just simply a guy standing, looking good with his physique. Um, I, I wanted to go for something more and you're going to take a chance. I don't pat myself on the back and no one should. You're not being brave or stunning or anything by going your own path. That's expected of you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's what you should do. And if you can't, if you can't tell an editor or answer an editor why you're doing something, you don't know why you're doing it. You have to have the answers. When I was asked, why are you drawing Batman with the cape so long? I gave him that answer of he's chasing me. He's in a room. Editor went, genius. That's brilliant. Keep doing it. Now, mm -hmm. if I had said, oh, because it's this way and that, and they'd say, well, it doesn't look like the character, or it doesn't look like the way we all do it, or it, that would have been the answer. But as soon as they heard that, they go, that's a good idea. And that's a different angle. Mm -hmm. And in all the years I worked with Danny O'Neill's the editor, he would tell me, you're the first guy in the history of it to come up with that angle. To, to show it that way. Neil, the great Neil Adams came up to me and said, as, as much as I am of the 70s, you are of the 90s. That You made it yours. And it's an important version. And I put you in my top 10 of all time who have ever done it. Now, I was a kid. I I couldn't speak. I was going to say, how did that feel? <laughs> I, I wanted to, I couldn't, it, it, what it meant was he wasn't talking to, and the thing that got me, Jason, it wasn't that he was talking to me luminary to young kid doing it he was saying peer-to-peer -peer because i had proved something and i had done something that idea wise he saw he, neil could see every single flaw in my work now you can't lie to that he could see every single flaw everything i didn't do right everything that i wasn't as as accomplished on that didn't matter to him what mattered to him was he went wow which is what you want is like, wow, I do not pat myself on the back on this. I think anyone can do it. That is my discovery. My great discovery after these things is not self personal me. I want anyone can do this. Anyone. Uh, I'm thinking about all the kids. We, we did comics this past week. I was teaching informational text. Mm -hmm. And I brought in comics because of the the close attention you pay to things in in yeah. comics, uh, and you have to to get yeah, all of you it. Do. And I'm just thinking about all of the kids every time we do comics that say, "I'm not good at drawing. I'm yeah. not good at drawing." And the adults yeah. are the same way. Okay, you can tell them neither was I. And in the eyes of a lot of my peers, and they are, I love they're nice to me. It's not I'm not saying it. they just go, God, you don't know how to this and this and this. And this. They can write, they can all see it. But they all come to me and say, but you influenced me. And my editors say, do you know what an influence you've been on the crop of artists now doing Batman and all that? You. And I've had them take me aside to tell me that. That they always mention you. And never once did any of those guys say, bad. it's because his perspective was right and his anatomy was good and everything was just blah, blah, blah. They didn't do that. It's like, they just said it was visceral. It was emotional. It, it was nightmarish. It was in, inspirational on those core deep down levels. And the only way that happens is ideas. So I always tell people, dream. It's okay to daydream. Write it down. Sketch it out. Just let your mind go those places because that's where the great ideas come. Not, you know, I'm convinced that the guy who uh, figured out how to transplant a human heart, it didn't come from, it was like, well, I bet if we did this, this would work. 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's anything. The guy who said, how do we get a spaceship off Earth? Oh, I bet if we tried this, this would, and they'd go, that wouldn't work. Hey, it worked. You know, right. um, it comes yeah. from those moments where your brain, it's almost supernatural because I can't tell you where they come from, these ideas. I just know that you get yourself in a place where they will happen. And then after a while, they start happening. You can be ordering a Big Mac at McDonald's. You go, oh, God, I got to give, yeah, give me a pencil or something like that. It, they just start coming because you've opened up that channel to it. And people have to be told it's okay to dream. Oh. Not not the dream I can be a president one day, but to just little dreams. Little things. And it changes your life. Nobody no matter, walks out. Sorry, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, it's just that it works every time. Nobody walks out of a really good film and goes, that was so symmetrical. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? No, uh, when they call them a feel-good movie, they used to use that as a put-down. And I went, no, that's exactly... Mm -hmm. Feel-good doesn't mean it all ended well. Yeah. I mean, you come out of Godfather 2 and he's all isolated and sad and you know, he's done all these horrible things. And you go, man, that was great. You don't go... You don't do it. You know, everything went wrong, but I want to mm -hmm. see that again. Mm -hmm. You know? Um, it's not the subject matter. It's the creation. But I always tell people... Well, how do I get the idea? So I said, number one, get a good night's rest. Mm -hmm. Be happy. I should do this more. <laughs> yeah, just, yeah. Just just, uh, do stuff that makes you happy. Stay in that world. Just do it. Doesn't mean sit there alone and go, I've got to think of something. It No, you just go. But number one, you got enough rest. Mm -hmm. And when you're not doing whatever it is, get away from it. I only do my drawing in my studio. I go anywhere. I don't even tell people what I do. I just go and let that part of the, I think I think, probably with uh, artists, you see it the most, but I think it's probably true of a lot of things, but with artists, you see it the most where you're two people. You're the person that has to function in the day take out the trash, go get the mail, go to the grocery store, take the kids to school, do all this stuff. And then there's that other guy who shoves the normal one out and does this thing. And and I've noticed, my family notices that. And they noticed it when I was a kid and they noticed it, they, they would just know it, know it. And at that point, you, um, you uh, realize it's a good Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Mm -hmm. Hyde it's is the where the idea it, it comes that's Hyde is that guy and um yeah my wife always noticed it I didn't notice it she would always notice it when that would start to happen and uh she said well your personality begins to change a little bit and you become more uh that that's the focus of what it is and and I um because I don't like to take advantage of that but I learned to follow it. She could tell I'd be start getting anxious. And it's like, yeah, you know, before the chicken lays the eggs, they cluck. <laughs> you know, I guess that's what it is. But sometimes I would just, you know, and she can tell when I've had a good day, it's because the best day isn't that I got some piece of art done. It's the idea came and it worked. Yeah. So I always, I mean, I, that's why I drum it into people. Let's get let's get that part working and get out of its way and don't apologize for it. And don't worry if the idea is someone else will like it. Do you like it? Because it has to be you like it first. Then other people will find it, even if it takes them a while to understand it. Um, I, in my career, have found this. Uh, people would tell me I didn't like the big ears, but then... I started to look at it and now it's the only way I can see that it's this weird thing, right? I mean, that always happens. Or they tell me, you know, I read comics and collected comics and I got rid of my comics, but I kept your comics. I kept, you know, you're amongst the ones I kept because I kept thinking about them. I go back and reread them and they got better every time. And that's true of, of uh, 
great music or great film or great paint, something where at first you're off put by it because it's the shock of the change. And what that means is it's not so much change, but it's it's that creator, that creator speaking directly to you from somewhere that's original in themselves. And that's why it's different. It isn't a mm -hmm. school of this or a school of that um, in and of itself. It may come from that. It may stand on the shoulders of that, but then it becomes its own. A human responding to the human on the page. And no amount of any technology will duplicate, imitate, recreate that, whatever. Um, it just won't. It can't. Um, because there's something uh, uh, impatient in humans. There's something uh, that is twitchy. It's always looking for something new. I always tell people, if you want to stay an artist for a long time, stay curious. Just stay curious. And that curiosity will make you keep doing it because you'll you'll eventually move on. You never, never want to say, I found something and I'm going to stick with it. But if you stay curious, it will change. You don't have to worry about that. You don't have to keep looking. A lot of people find a style and they're afraid to change anything. And my biggest fear is I would have to be drawing the same way forever and ever and ever. It's like, no, I I, I just stay curious. So other subjects interest me or um, uh, things that that uh, that I never thought of that would be interesting become interesting. And then that 